to gather together and we love to sing of your story the pathway that you took that you volunteered for that you came down to do for us all in the name of love we thank you for that father we thank you for that pathway to Easter and all the pain that you endured to break that chain of sin Lord to reconcile us to you and we are grateful. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, welcome to Canby Four Square Church this morning. It's so good to be together. And just to dedicate this morning, dedicate this specific time to praise his name, to honor him, to speak of his name, and to commune with him and to commune with each other. As we continue the set this morning, so much of the songs this morning are just about Jesus' story. So let's settle our hearts as we come through the doors this morning. Sometimes it's a rush. Sometimes there's lots of things in our minds and our hearts. Let's just settle our spirits and commune with him and just kind of enter into his story. Maybe in a new way, maybe in a fresh way. But let's be mindful of what we're singing and the path that he chose to walk out for us. Dread. 
drenched in tears. They laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance sealed by heavy stone. Jesus, my 
powerful name it is. Nothing can stand against what a powerful name it is. The name. for how wonderful and how beautiful and how powerful you are. And we just exalt your name to the highest this morning. We thank you so much for walking out your path that was before you. And we're so grateful, Father. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So good. Let's turn to one another this morning and greet each other. Hey friends, welcome to church. If you guys could find your way back towards your seats, that'd be wonderful. Uh, let me tell you a quick story. By the way, I'm Pastor James, if you don't know me. I get the privilege of serving on staff here as a pastor at Canby Four Square Church, but I also get to serve as the dean of Canby Bible College. And a couple of years ago, the president of CBC, Pastor Ron, um, he looked around and he said, you know, I would really... I feel, I feel led by the Lord to see if we can expand the reach of CBC to include international students from South Korea. And uh, we partnered with uh, Jody Gill, who works in uh, higher education, connecting schools in the Pacific Rim with Christian schools here on the West Coast. And uh, that was probably 2016 and 2017. We had a school visit from three principals and leaders of three schools from South Korea come here. That was in February. Um, and then that following August, we were able to admit the first of our South Korean students, uh, Lily and Zion. And then in January, we added Gabby. Um, and then also in January, I got the privilege to go to South Korea for nine days to meet with our partner school there, Kara Christian School. And now we have the honor to be able to host uh, Kara Christian School and Joyful Church and their leaders, uh, Pastor Chung and Principal Kim. So would you please welcome them to the stage here.
When I went to South Korea, we were there to sign what is called a Memorandum of Understanding, an MOU, uh, which was a great honor between Canby Bible College and Kara Christian School. Uh, the principal, Kim, which is Pastor Chung's wife, she is the principal there. We were so honored to do that. That puts us in formal relationship and agreement there to be able to send and receive students and leaders uh, for mutual, um, mutual upbuilding for the work of the gospel and for uh, the grace of God between both organizations. And so we are very honored to have Pastor Chung and his wife, Principal Kim, to join us here. Uh, Pastor Chung is on sabbatical, staying with us for the next several months, uh, participating in the life of Canby Bible College um, and serving in a variety of ways. So Pastor Chung, would you mind saying a few words for our folks there? Hello, everyone. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank, uh, thank you for uh, inviting me uh, here. Uh, I'm David Jung. I serve Joyful Church in Korea as a senior pastor. Um, uh, I thank her for your warm heart, and I, um, I'm enjoying the, this time uh, because you're the providing the nice uh, guest house and uh, your warm the hearted uh, hospitality uh, last year uh, we made the mou uh, between the kimbi bible college and the uh, kara christian school so uh, our uh, uh, students uh, are studying in cbc right now uh, they uh, they are very happy uh, because a uh, good the uh, college and good uh, warm the heart families. So I appreci appreciate them, uh, the heart families. So uh, and I I have uh, the vision to make uh, disciples and uh, for world mission. So I want to uh, make a MOU uh, can, be, uh, can, can be full scale church and our church uh, because I know that uh, your church have the uh, same vision uh, with, uh, with our church uh, in according, uh, you know, according to uh, have a mission or making disciples, uh, etc. I know that. So uh, I'm very happy to make uh, MOU uh, with your church. So, and uh, uh, I, I'm, uh, uh, I am forward to uh, make a relationship uh, with your church, the more uh, to develop the relationship. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you for listening to my broken English. Thank you. <laughs> Pastor Chung and his wife have, were incredibly hospitable to me and the team when we went to South Korea, and it is our honor uh, to return the same. And we are very grateful to enter into that partnership, that MOU, that Memorandum of Understanding he was mentioning. Uh, we will enter into this upcoming Tuesday when Pastor Ron and the team, who, by the way, are coming back from Kenya after a very successful trip there. So you can praise God for that. We are just grateful to partner with um, our friends. And like Pastor Chung was mentioning, the same vision to make disciples who make disciples is there with Joyful Church and here with Canby Foursquare Church. And we are so honored to be able to partner in that and to be able to provide host families for the students who come this way to study at Canby Bible College. Um, and for our, it, for our students and interns who can go that way as well. Uh, to live and work in Seoul, South Korea. So exciting times, gr much to be grateful for. So Pastor Chung, Principal Kim, thank you so much. Uh, um, yeah, that's Korean for thank you. Um, <laughs> those, I, I know two Korean words, so 
There you go. Um, all right, friends. Uh, if you are here, and uh, of course you're here, um, the, uh, what we're going to do next is uh, take an offering because we believe in the power of generosity. We have been blessed by the goodness of God. And so if we can invite our ushers to come forward, I just want to remind you that what we do here can be Foursquare is we invest in things that make disciples who make disciples. We saw it last week uh, with Karen Armstrong, who's going out to serve with YWAM locally with our uh, Karis uh, Elementary Lunch Buddies program. You'll see it next week when you see Pastor Arlene Tatum come and talk about her upcoming trip to Africa. You see it in the team that's coming back from Kenya right now. We want to be engaged in the work of the ministry to equip leaders, to proclaim the gospel, and to bless the community. That's what we are about, and we're honored to receive the gifts that enable us to do that. So let's go ahead and pray. Uh, Jesus, we love you and we are thankful for your great grace in our lives. Lord, continue to open doors of provision for us. Help us to be good stewards of that which you have entrusted to us. Uh, God, we trust you daily uh, for your provision and for your guidance. Uh, Lord, help us continue to break down the power of the idolatry of money. Let us not serve it, but rather let us use it to serve you. In your name we pray. Amen and amen. All right, as always, we've got some video announcements, and then none other but Pastor Colin Reed will come up and bless God's people with the word this morning. Welcome to Canby Four Square Church. My name is Hudson Mickle, and these are your weekend announcements. If this is your first time to Canby Four Square, Welcome. We're so glad that you're here. If throughout this service you find yourself with any questions, concerns, anything like that, feel free to reach into the seat back in front of you and grab the welcome card. Fill this card out and turn it into the welcome desk and we'll have a pastor call you and answer any questions that you have. Kids Camp Fundraiser is happening today in the lobby where you can buy some cool crafts to help send a kid to camp. It's all at the resource desk, along with important dates and registration packets for camp. Come check it out. Our community Easter egg hunt is coming up March 31st at 5 p.m. If you plan on attending, come early because it goes fast. We can still use a lot of volunteers. The whole community comes, so we'd love to show them the love of Jesus while they're here and show them where to park. Hey friends, Pastor James here, Dean of Canby Bible College. CBC, like Canby Foursquare, exists with one purpose, to make disciples who make disciples for Jesus. We are confident that Canby Bible College can help equip you to be more biblically informed more passionately in love with Jesus, more empowered by the Holy Spirit to make a difference in this world. For more information, check out our Spring Preview Day. April 7th at 6.30 p.m. is our men's barbecue. I went to this event last year and I can just say it is a great opportunity to eat some incredible food and this year hear from special guest speaker Ben Dixon. If you're interested, you can sign up in the lobby or go online to canbyfoursquare.com. All right, that's all the announcements I have for you today. Enjoy the service. All right, good morning, everyone. My name is Colin, and uh, I have the privilege of being a pastor on staff here at Canby Foursquare. And uh, it's a privilege to be over here with you. Normally on Sundays, I'm over with our youth. And uh, God's just doing some really cool stuff 
over there, and it's always exciting to get over here and see everybody else. So, uh, and may having a good weekend, enjoying the weather. I think it's been really nice. The sun's been out, and yesterday went for a walk and just kind of enjoyed that. And um, I've, I don't know, I, I just think that sometimes we need a reminder that God loves us, and the sun uh, in Oregon is, is an especially good sign of that, right? Uh, we're getting ready for Easter, believe it or not. Um, it's April 1st, no joke. Uh, and so as we're getting ready for Easter, one of the things that we talked about as pastors was we said, what are we going to cover? And one of the things we wanted to cover is kind of the path to Easter. What, what gets us to Easter? You know, I think in the church, especially we celebrate Christmas and Easter. And sometimes um, in that, we kind of miss a little bit of the in-between. And so uh, today I'm hoping to cover a little bit of the in-between. And uh, it's not going to be like, this is a message that I like squirmed the whole time that I was writing because I didn't like it. Because like it spiritually was calling me to higher, a higher standard than I'm even living now. And so um, I'm hoping that you will be as uncomfortable as I am while I preach this. And uh, hopefully you'll leave here challenged uh, because that's, as disciples, if we're not being challenged, we're not growing. If we're not growing, we're not really being disciples. And so... Uh, as we get ready to do that, um, I'll give you the title of my message. is just Jesus, and it's uh, the key to an uncomfortable life. So we're just going to go ahead and start off right away. Um, living like Jesus should cause you to be uncomfortable. If, you are to tr- if we are to truly live like Jesus, it should cause you to be a little uncomfortable. And over the next little bit of my message, I, I hope to kind of unpack that. Uh, who likes to be uncomfortable? Anybody like uncomfortable is, is like the way to live? Yeah, I didn't think so. Uh, you know, being uncomfortable is, is no fun, but we experience it all the time, whether it's for job interviews, first dates, door-to-door salesmen. And if you're door-to-door salesman, even you're uncomfortable. Like, being uncomfortable is a part of life, and how we respond to being uncomfortable is really kind of what... I'm going to talk about today. And so uh, let's start off and we'll pray and then we'll get right into it. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for loving us. We thank you so much for caring for us. And God, I pray that as we hear this, God, it would not only be words, but God, rather be, be things to respond to in our heart. In your name, amen. If you have your Bibles, we're going to go to John 16, 33 in a minute. But go ahead and start flipping there. Uh, I've got a little story because as I was thinking about uncomfortable times in my life, I've got, a, I've got many of them, um, as I'm sure many of us do. But I remember in college specifically, I had, I had mentors and, and pastors and leaders who, who liked to make me feel uncomfortable. Uh, one in particular, he says, hey, Colin, I'm doing a missions trip and we're going to Honduras. I would love for you to come. And like, I'm all about missions trips. I'm all about that stuff. But I was like, Honduras sounds a little like there's not going to be a comfortable bed. It sounds like there's not going to be, like, I'm not sure what I'm going to be eating. And uh, it doesn't sound like we're going to get a lot of sleep. And we've got to spend a lot of time driving around in vans. And he goes, yeah, that's about right. And I was like, sounds really uncomfortable. And he goes, it will be. And he just smiled at me. Like, that was it. And so he talked me into it. And uh, in, on that trip, it was a super great trip. It was a life-changing trip for me. But in particular, one, one night, we had driven like five or six hours from the church that we were visiting uh, in a van through the jungle to this church plant. And we were going to stay the night, and the next morning we were going to go back into the town that we were initially staying at. And so we get to the church, and like we have this amazing, powerful service. Like God's moving. All of a sudden, thunder, lightning, storms come. We lose power. We still do church. Like God's moving. Awesome stuff's happening. And you know, people are dancing and like turning on their flashlights, and like it's just this really, really cool moment. Uh, about midway through, power comes back on. Service gets over. And they said, okay, we're going to divide up and we're going to go. I'm going to split you guys up and we're going to go to different homes. And 
So, you know, everybody's getting split off in twos or threes. And I was like, oh, okay, this is going to be fun. And then I'm standing there with the leader of the trip. And I was like, sweet, I'm going to where he's going. Like, this is awesome. And he goes, Colin, why don't you go with this family? I was like, by, by myself? He goes, yeah, 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 you'll be fine. Now, I mean, I grew up kindergarten. I was in a bilingual Spanish-English class. So, you know, uh, I'm really proficient in my Spanish from that one year. Um, where most of my focus was spent trying to learn how to tie my shoes. Um, not, not let alone speak Spanish. But, so, they're like, okay, get in the car. I get in this truck with this family. And there's like seven people in the family. And it's like a little, little like Datsun like truck. And there's like kids all over me. And we're driving. And we drive pretty far. And like we're talking. And I do know enough Spanish to kind of get me through a little bit of conversation. And we're talking and we're going. And we're, we get to the house. And finally like we're talking a little more. And then I'm like, I'm out. I'm out of Spanish. Like I know no more words. So I just do the international like... All right, like bedtime. And so I go to sleep, and the next morning he goes, All right, let's go. We get in the, get in the car, and I think we're going to go to the church. And we pull up to a, uh, this big warehouse, and he brings, like, shady looking Honduras warehouse. Like, and he pulls up, and he goes, Come on. And I was like, This is where I die. This is where I die. This is really where I die. And uh, all of a sudden I'm walking with him, and all of a sudden he disappears. Like, literally just disappears in this warehouse, and all of a sudden this door, side door opens up, and he gives me, like, a little soccer jersey, right? Like, it was really cool, really awesome. And then he goes, all right, I'm going to Texaco. I was like, no, I know one word, and that's not how you say church. Uh, church is iglesia. And so I'm like, iglesia, iglesia. He goes, no, Texaco. So he literally drops me off at Texaco, and we're an hour earlier than anybody else, and he leaves. So here I am, like hiking backpack on in the middle of Honduras, like I'm going to die here. I don't know how to get a hold of anybody. I don't have a phone. I don't have a phone number. I, here I am thinking I'm going to die. And hour later, my, like I've never been so happy to see like people that I knew. I'm like kissing the ground that they're, well, I'm so glad you're here. I thought I was going to die. And, and then he goes, hey, Colin, were you pretty uncomfortable with that? And I was like, yeah, I thought I was going to die. I thought I was stuck in, I thought I was going to have to live in Honduras for the rest of my life, stuck here. And he goes, oh, that's good for you. So being uncomfortable is good for you. Now let's go to John sixteen thirty three. So it says, I have told you these things so that you may have peace in this world. You will have trouble, but take heart, I have over." Come the world. He's telling the disciples here, he's giving them a whole list of things about why they should be secure in knowing that Jesus is about to leave. And he, he's telling them all these things. Like, this is why you should know, don't worry, I've overcome the world. And, and the way, and he's telling them things are going to be different from here on out, too. And what I also love is that he, the way that he overcame the world was not the way that people were expecting him to overcome the world. Like he, he was expected to be this leader, and he came differently, right? He came a little differently, and he came in almost kind of like Mary Poppins style, right? Like unconventional, like what is this person up to? Like they're a little crazy, but uh, things aren't going to be the same. I, I kind of get it, you know? Like you guys remember that? Mary Poppins comes in, and it's like, what is this lady doing? Like who is she? And I, I think Jesus is kind of the same effect, Right? Like, who is this guy and what is he doing? Like, he makes people uncomfortable, but ultimately he came to save the lost. And that's what Jesus came to do. And Jesus, he did. He made, he made people uncomfortable. Right? Like, Jesus did. Think about this. Like, think about this story, okay? An unexpected baby boy born in a cave next to some animals, born to parents who weren't married, and the fiance father didn't was very sure that it wasn't his and he grew up you know pretty normal and then in his 20s decides to go recruit people to start walking around and couch surfing and doing some awesome stuff like that doesn't sound like 
the man who's supposed to save humanity from, you know, evil, right? Like, that's, that sounds like maybe like your nephew or like your son or, you know, some, somebody's just kind of like, oh, I'm going to kind of chill and figure out what I want to do. Um, it doesn't sound like, and people were expecting Jesus to be this, like, military king who was going to come and make things right with the sword and who was going to make people worship and, and bow down at his feet. And they were waiting for this. Someone that looks good. Somebody who looks like a savior. Like they're hoping for this tall, chiseled king who's going to lead them into the promised land of the future, right? And that's not how he came at all. He came with very humble beginnings. And it made people uncomfortable. It made people think, like, this really can't be our Messiah because this isn't isn't who's going to save us. Like, This is a guy who's just walking around, right? They were waiting for a king, but Jesus came as a humble servant. And what I love about Jesus is that, like, he didn't come to just be a comfort for us. He came to confront religion. He came to confront our ideology of who God was. He came to confront those things so that you and I later on in life could discover that God is good. I mean, you think about all that that happened in the ancient Near East was all about what I had to give in order for God to love me. And Jesus came to say, no, no, no. It's about how much God loves you, and he sent me to prove it. There is comfort in in Jesus. There is, you know, he's not just here to comfort or confront. He, He We do get the Holy Spirit whose role is the comforter. But that's not who we're talking about today. We're talking about Jesus, who came to confront the misconceptions of who God was. Jesus, being the Messiah, made people uncomfortable. Because he came from normal parents. He came from a normal place. He came from Nazareth. He came from a place where people were like, does anything good come out of there? He came to flip religion on its head and show people that you don't have to earn God's forgiveness, that he's already forgiven you and he already loves you. So his arrival was scandalous, his mission was scandalous, and his actions were scandalous. See, Jesus, Jesus wasn't normal. Jesus didn't fit into the status quo of, of a religious leader or a rabbi. He kind of made, he paved his way to his own thing, which he very much should have because he was a savior. He came with the mission to save people through the love of God. And how he chose to do that made people squirm a little bit. It made people uncomfortable, especially the religious leaders. Because one of the things I love about Jesus is he never left anywhere or anyone the same. He never left anyone or anywhere he went the same. Every time he came out, he came, he made a difference. I mean, you even think about so many different people that he called on and, and talked to. And he wouldn't let people be alone. He wouldn't let people be how they were. Don't you guys love people like that who make you do stuff you don't want to do? Who call you to places like you, you don't want to go, that you're uncomfortable with? You know, you're like, yeah, I'd rather not. It's like, just come. And then you end up, you know, enjoying it or things like that. Uh, I, I had a professor that in college, my, my bread and butter was getting B's. Like, I didn't want to get A's. It was too much work. I just wanted to do good enough to get B's, pass my classes, Uh, don't take my advice, students. Always go for an A. Try your hardest. Uh, But I would do everything up until like five minutes before class, right? I was always the guy who's like, hey, I had some printer problems. And they're like, well, if you didn't print it like three minutes before class, you wouldn't have, the problem was the printer was too slow for me. But so that's how my freshman, sophomore year was just kind of like, get it done, turn it in. You know, I I made good grades. But I was taking a class on 1 Peter, and uh, I turn in a paper, and in a big, it says, it says on the, it says a B- A minus on the top. 
and then it's scratched out, and it says, a, has a D on it, and it said, come see me after class. And I was like, what? Like, how do you go from an A minus to a D? Like, even if I didn't, like, cite a source correctly, like, that's a, that's a big percentage. And you know what he said to me? He said, Colin, I want to talk to you about your project. He said, it was really good for everybody else. He's like, but you're better than this. And I was like, so you're saying I got an A, but you're giving me a D? He goes, yeah, you can do better than this, and I'm calling you to a higher standard. And we spent every Thursday night for weeks at his house after his kids went to bed working on my first Peter homework. But he said, you're better than this. You need to give all your effort. And you know what? At the time, I hated it. I hated that I had somebody who wanted to call me to a higher standard because I just wanted to skate through. But I learned a lot about Jesus from this man. His name was Professor Duzik. And he, uh, he called me to be better. And he showed me Jesus in a way that I had never seen before. Where I had thought Jesus was really just calling me to obey a set of, of rules and, and standards. But really, I, was real, I realized in this moment that Jesus calls us to a better life. And sometimes that better life requires more effort. Sometimes that better life requires us to get uncomfortable. Sometimes that better life requires us at 10 o'clock every Thursday for like seven or eight weeks going to a professor's house and working on homework. Duzik did that for me. Jesus does that for everyone. I mean, think about this. Even Jesus at 12 is in the temple and he's teaching these religious leaders all about God and how good he is and how loving he is. And don't we all just love 12-year-olds telling us how wrong we are? Right? Like, how awesome is that? Hey, you're wrong. Like, shut up, you little twerp. Get out of here. Like, go play. Go outside, right? That was Jesus. Jesus at 12. And then we think of John the Baptist, right? In... uh, in Matthew 3.13, he, Jesus comes up to John the Baptist and, and John says, oh, oh, will you, will you baptize me? What an honor it would be to baptize me. And Jesus is like, no, I'm not going to baptize you. You need to baptize me because that's your calling. You're not called to be baptized by me. You're called to baptize me. You're better than that. Like, there's Jesus, like already we see that. And then the calling of the disciples, right? In Luke 5, we see Jesus, this random dude, come up and say, hey, push off your boats real quick so I can talk to the crowd. Rub anybody else the wrong way real quick. And then when he gets done, he goes, hey, why don't you guys throw your nets on the other side? Now remember, these are professional fishermen. They said, dude, because they use dude a lot in the Bible. Um, <laughs> Dude, we've been fishing all day. Ain't no fish out here. And he said, just, just try it. You know, like I said, we all love being told what to do, right? We all love to be told we're doing wrong. What happens? They throw their nets over. And the, the boat starts to sink because of all the fish they were catching. Jesus is never going to call you to something less than what you're living. He's always going to call you to a greater standard. We think about the woman in the well in John 4, right? She comes every day to get her water, and then she goes home, and she comes back every day. And Jesus in John 4, 13 says, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks from the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up in eternal life. He's telling her that there's way more to life than just living every day. There's way more that you are capable of. And, you know, if you know the story, you know this woman, this, you know, five, six, you know, seven husbands and all these things. And he's saying there's more to life than what you're doing. There's an eternal life available for you. Jesus made people uncomfortable. You think this woman was comfortable having this man, like, tell her what's going on in her life, what's happening, but then also saying there's something better for you? We also see in Mark 3, 
verse 1 through 6, Jesus healing on the Sabbath. It made everybody uncomfortable, especially the religious leaders, right? Like, you can't heal on the Sabbath. We see him come up to a man with a shriveled hand, and, you know, he's sitting there, and Jesus said, he, he said, he heals him, stand up and show him. And then in verse 4, it says, Then Jesus asked them, Which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save a life or to kill? But they remained silent. He looked around at them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts. And he said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his shriveled hand was completely restored. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. Talk about making somebody uncomfortable, right? Like these people wanted to plot to kill him because he was... He was taking what was normal and, and flipping it up on its head. And so Jesus it continues to do that. And he does that by hanging out with sinners and tax collectors. In Mark 2.13, we see him calling Levi the tax collector. And if you know anything about tax collectors, is religious people and tax collectors did not hang out at all. Because tax collectors were chief, you know, chief sinners. Right and, and religious leaders were too clean and too pure to hang out with those types of people. And, and so much so that it even made, it made the religious leaders upset that he hung out with them, that he called them. And he said, we can even see it here. It says, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Is there anybody else who's grateful that he calls sinners? Like, I'm so grateful that even in my sin, even in my life, Jesus still calls me his son. He still calls me to pastor and lead. He still calls me to things that are greater than I deserve. Because that's how he works. He works in love. We also see Jesus anointed by a sinful woman in Luke 7.36. Right? Jesus is going up and he's hanging out with his friends and all of a sudden this woman comes up. You know, and this woman of you know, ill repute and a sinful woman and she comes up and she breaks perfume and dumps it on Jesus' feet and starts washing his feet with her tears and her hair. And you know, we see the religious leaders, right? And they said, Man, if this, new, if this guy really was who he says he is, he'd know that this woman, what kind of woman she is, and that she's a sinner. And then Jesus tells him, he said, I got something, I got something to tell you real quick. And he tells this little story. And then he turned to the woman, and I don't know if I'm going to be able to make this without crying, because the last four times I've read it, I've cried, so... Bear with me. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore I tell you, many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven, little lo- loves little. And Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. It doesn't matter what sin's in your life. It doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter what your story is. Jesus is always going to call you and give you a better life. This woman here, her love of Jesus is shown by the way that she gets at his feet dumps perfume on it. And what I love is that Jesus let her do it. Even though even though she shouldn't have been up there, even though she shouldn't have been touching him, even though all the things that society and all of the social norms said, don't allow this woman to do this because it's wrong. Jesus said, no, no, no. I want to be close to sinners. I want, and you guys could all learn something from this woman. We also see it, again, Jesus confronting societal norms and religion when 
There's a woman who's caught in adultery and all these religious leaders and Pharisees are ready to get and kill this woman by stoning her. And Jesus comes into the picture and says, whoa, 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 hold on a second. Hold on. Why, are we, why, why does this woman deserve to be killed? Well, she was caught in adultery. Now, this is a message for another time. How did they catch her in adultery? Like, if we think about that for a second, like, how did these religious leaders catch this woman in the act of adultery? Somebody might have been involved. I don't know. I'm not saying, but I'm saying something. So they're getting ready to, and he said, all right, but let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. Then he stooped down again and started writing in the dust. When the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest, until Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. Then he stood up and said to her, Where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, Neither do I. Go and sin no more. There's countless times in Scripture where we see Jesus in places that would make me uncomfortable that made the people around him uncomfortable. But it's because Jesus chose to unashamedly break all social and societal norms in order to accomplish his mission. See, Jesus loved all people. It didn't matter if you were a sinner. It didn't matter if you are a religious leader. He might have been angry at the religious leaders. He might have been upset at them. But never once does it say that Jesus didn't love them. Jesus loved all people, no matter where, no matter when, no matter how. He loved them. Jesus lived on mission. Everywhere he went, he lived on mission, which was to save the lost, which was to share the idea that grace is available to you and I. Grace is available to the world, that God so loved the world that he sent his only son. And he left everything different than when he got it. Jesus never left without enhancing their lives. He never left someone without making their life better. It's really, really inspiring, right, to read that about Jesus and see how Jesus lives. It's really inspiring until we realize that we've been called to live the same way. We've been called to love people that make us uncomfortable. We've been, we've been called to love all. We should love all people. And it's really easy to like and love people who are like me. And it's even, it's even easy for me to love people who are disenfranchised and the poor and, you know, who need, compa- who need my compassion, right? It's easy to love those people or, or show some t- sort of love, but we're even called to love the people we don't like. Maybe it's somebody in your office. Maybe it's a family member. For me, as I was writing this and working on this, I'm thinking of all the people that I've turned my back on because they annoy me. Right? Anybody else? Like, just me. Like, there's a guy in his gym, and like, he, at my gym, he's always trying to like wrestle me. And I'm like, I'm like, dude, I just turn my back and walk away. <laughs> Which, you know, is whatever. But then, like, as I'm writing this, God's like, hey, what if you just said, hey, I'm not really wrestle, wrestle guy. Like, I'm not, not trying to wrestle with you, buddy. Like, just don't touch me. Like, how about, how about having a conversation and engaging him? Like, That's how we show love to people, is by engaging them and saying, acknowledging their existence and their humanity. And you know what? I know that everybody else in my gym turns their back on him too. So he's lonely. Right? We gotta love those people that we don't want to. We've gotta live on, we should live on mission. We should live on purpose. I go through my life so often just on cruise control through the day. Right? But when I look at how Jesus lived, he always was on mission and looking for people. 
You think about this. I mean, there's a story in the Bible that we highlight a lot, especially uh, as, as we're younger and even that, is that Jesus is just walking down the street, right? And he sees Zacchaeus and says, hey, come down here. I'm coming over. Like, this wasn't like, Jesus like, all right, today I'm going to try to, my mission is to grab a tax collector from a tree. No, he was just living, and yeah, he knew it was going to happen and all that, but he was just living and doing how he, and, and living and doing is on mission, and he sees Zacchaeus and says, I can make a difference in your life because you're better than hiding in the tree. You're better than ripping these people off. There's more for your life. And then we should leave everyone we encounter, we should leave them, we should enhance their life. We should leave them better than we found them. Every person, if we're going to really love like Jesus, we're going to really live like Jesus, we should never leave anyone without enhancing their life. And that's really easy to say. It's really good to say. But it's even really hard to live. So what I'm hoping to do today is, is mess with you a little bit. Mess with your life. And I'm sorry. It's a little uncomfortable. But it's how we're called to live. It's how we're called to be. Maybe, maybe I've even messed with who you're thinking about inviting to Easter. You know, invite the neighbor you like. Invite, you know, a friend from work who you like. But maybe you need to bring the people at work you don't like. Maybe you need to, to invite the neighbor who borrowed your rake two years ago and still hasn't given it back and you're angry at them every day. I don't want to just rock your thinking today. I don't want to just like inspire you a new thought process. And what what I really feel like God has asked for me today is not to just mess with your orthodoxy, what you believe. Like, you know, it's good to believe this stuff and know this stuff, right? It's really good. Okay, yeah, I got to get out there. I got to love people. I got to live on mission. But what I'm hoping to mess with today is our orthopraxy. And our orthopraxy is how we live it out, what we do. Jesus lived out his life by loving all. He lived out his life by living on mission and enhancing the lives of everyone he came encounter with. Now we should go out and do the same. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you that you love us despite our sin, that you always call us out to a greater life. And God, right now we pray that we could take this message today and not just hear it and maybe say that was a good thought or even be upset that I would call us to, that you would call us to this, but God, that we would actually go out and live like you did. We know that you're good. We know that you're sovereign, God. Would you give us the courage and the boldness to stand in front of societal norms and stand in front of things that maybe cause us to get judged, maybe cause us to be plotted against, God, so that we can show the lost that they're loved and that they matter and they're important. In your name, amen.